Now, what, what can I say about Tony? What, what can I say? I mean, he wears so many different hats. Let's see, he is a deacon. He serves with the uh, prayer team every Monday night for prayer. He's also over here in the prayer in the, when they pray on Sundays. He uh, serves with uh, third or fourth grade. Uh, one day I called him up. I said, hey, Tony, I'm short uh, male teachers for the, uh, for the kids. He said, Pastor, whatever you need, I'm here for you. Whatever you need. That's just the, the kind of heart that he has. He's, he wears several different hats within our church. He's always serving. I mean, that, if, if I had to use one word to sum Tony up, it would just be servant. That's just, that's, that's the heart. He, let's just give him a hand for that. So we're so excited and privileged to have Tony. Can we just stretch our hands towards him? Father, we thank you, God, for Tony, Lord, and, and the word that you've uh, poured within him, Lord God. And we're just so excited, Father, that he, he has his chance to, to, to share, Lord God. And, and Father, we pray, God, that you would just, first of all, anoint him, Lord. Oh, we pray, God, that you would just use him, Lord God. Let him be your vessel, Lord God, this afternoon for your glory, Father. We pray, God, that you would use him mightily, Lord God. We pray, God, that, that, that every word that he speaks will be from you, Lord God, and that our hearts are ready to receive everything that you have for us. We're excited to have him. He's one of our own. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, bro. Amen. Thank you. Love you. Amen. Are y'all ready today? So I know many of you came and you're used to having pastor come up here and preach, but he's away at one of his golf outing things or something like that. So I'm his preaching uh, double. All right, no, I'm just joking. But he is away, and so he has uh, asked me for this opportunity. If any of you uh, know me, uh, then you know that this is a great opportunity for me to uh, be here today to, to share this word. And so I'm going to get right into it. Um, Again, Pastor has been on fire with the messages, so uh, as his double, I hope to continue to keep that same fire going. So let us stand and open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. The word of the Lord said, as you can just track with me or pull out your phones or your Bibles. The word of the Lord says in Ephesians 4, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. And when you were called, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given to Christ, a portion, and Christ as Christ apportioned it. And this is what it says, that when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts of his people. And verse 10, he who descends in every, um, and he who descends is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe and so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophet, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his body, his people of works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. And I know Pastor Keith prayed, but I just want to quickly again, Father God, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And I just pray that as the hearts of those that are here, if you would just let their hearts be receptive to this word, I pray that your Holy Spirit and your anointing is in this place for the edifying and building up of your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. So um, last week, Pastor had mentioned the gifts of the fivefold ministries. And so... Um, as we just read, uh, that Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, uh, the pastors, and the teachers. And he discussed how every one of us is responsible for helping Christ build the kingdom and that we are ought to show unity into the body of Christ while we do so. Also in the book, uh, 
5Q by Alan Hirsch, discusses the importance of fivefold ministry, citing that it was put in place by Christ, so it must be important for the church. Works of service do this. Well, again, in Ephesians 12, if we look at it, it says, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, in verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith. Can we all say all reach? And in the knowledge of the Son of God. And so it, it goes, it, it carries on. So if we all, it's until we all reach unity in faith and until we all reach unity into the knowledge of the Son of God. And so today I want to focus on evangelism. The evangelist involves the proclamation of the good news, and that is at the core of the church message. So he or she is the storyteller, the recruiter to the cause for the building up of the church and by sharing the knowledge of the Son of God. So let me ask you a question as I move forward. I want you to think about this as we move through. How would you reach someone like me if you were an evangelist, let me share my story. I was born to my mother, Jean Lawler. At a tender age of 16 years old, my mom had me. In her words, she had low self-esteem and self-worth and low self-worth growing up. Her parents worked often, but sometimes they stopped at the local tavern before they came home. So my mom was lonely and my mom found comfort in men in relationships with men. And by the time that she was 22 years old, my mom had five boys. Now, Pastor Cersei always talks about the number of kids that they have, but he don't have anything on my mother. <laughs> the men in her life were either abusive or non-supportive, and we lived on welfare. And while my mom was with my stepfather, my youngest two brothers' uh, father, they turned to a life of drugs. As a result, we moved around running from drug dealers and running because we couldn't keep up with the rent and the bills due to their drug habits. So we were often left alone while they went out and they smoked their drugs, but sometimes they would lock us in our room so they can smoke with their friends in the living room. And when I was old enough to work, I did. I delivered newspapers in the morning before going to school. And then after school, I worked at the local grocery store when I got off of football practice. However, my mom would be standing right there waiting as soon as I was getting paid so that she can take my check and she can go buy drugs. I resented her for, for that, and I began to grow hatred towards my mother and my absentee father. Eventually, my mom split from my father, and she ended up getting arrested for selling drugs to an undercover cop. And at the age of 13... My brothers and I were split up and sent into foster care. Now, I bounced around my entire high school career from home to home, and my brothers, they found home in the streets until that unforgettable night on August 3rd. Bang, 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 bang. Two shots to the neck, two shots to the chest, as my brother's lifeless body fell to the ground. I had no ambition to go to college since no one in my family ever attended. I had no idea what college was. So I turned down a full ride track scholarship to North Central College. And my mom was still in jail by this time and I professed hatred towards her. Write this down if you're taking notes, no ambition. I was very sad and I didn't see the point of living that year. I struggled in school and I was on the verge of quitting. Write this down if you're taking notes. No will to live. And at the age of 27, I got married to a young lady that I was dating, but I ended up, it ended up in a bitter divorce. So write this down, no love. And after I moved back to Chicago, I joined a church and became close to a pastor Wilkinson, eventually four years later, he passed away from ALS, broken. Eventually, I changed my career path and I began working with Youth in Care as a way for me to give back and to fill that void that I had. 
And a few years later, I co-founded a nonprofit organization with two other former foster youth. And we were the first in Illinois to start an organization specifically working with youth until the age of 25. And at this point, I wanted to continue on in my college career. And so in 2012, I applied for Wheaton College to get into their graduate school for evangelism and leadership. However, I had to take an entry exam and I failed it four times. Write this down, failure. Then one year later in 2013, my then six month old daughter was in an accident minutes before checking out of the hotel with the family. And as I was showering, I heard a loud cry and I peeped out to assess the situation and I seen her in the arms of my stepdaughter and she was red and screaming to the top of her lungs. And I asked her what happened and she said that she failed. And I quickly grabbed my daughter to assess the situation and she began to have a seizure and instantly stopped breathing. Nearly dead, the paramedics rushed to the hospital and, the emerg and had, she had to have emergency surgery. And though she survived the surgery, she needed to be put into a medically induced coma to stabilize her. The doctor said that he didn't think that she was gonna make it. And that next day we were questioned by the nurse about the accident. However, the nurse didn't believe us, so the detectives came in and they arrested us and took us to jail. And we were accused of abuse. And so I was pronounced guilty until proven innocent. Write this down. I couldn't afford an attorney. I spent a few days in jail and I didn't, it didn't let me, they didn't let me make a phone call. But eventually I was able to speak with an attorney and that attorney told me not to talk to the police anymore. And of course, this made them mad and furious. And so they began to threaten me and they told me that my daughter was dead. Now I'm feeling shocked and hopeless and I became numb. So write this down, hopeless. Eventually we were released and immediately went to the hospital thinking that my daughter was dead and come to find out that she was still in a coma but DCFS had taken custody of her and they wouldn't allow us to see her for several days. And then when they allowed us to see us, it was only for one hour. And then a few weeks later, it was a little more and a little more. And then during the same time, my organization decided to let me go. I was completely shut out from the entire company. DCFS had restricted me from working with, with children while I was going through a trial. So I became homeless. I was couch surfing, sleeping on people's couches, trying to find places to stay. And everything that I had was gone. My daughter ended up in foster care. All the while I had to suffer to prove to my, daughter, to my own child. And then to make matters worse, I lost both of my grandmothers in 2014. And then I lost my mother in November of 2016. The majority of my life was tragic and troubling. Write this down, loss. I lost my job, I lost my home, I lost my grandmothers, I lost my mom, and I lost my daughter. So is there really a point to live? Which brings me to the point of this message today. Who will cry for the little child lost and all alone? Who will cry for the little child whose daddy never came home? Who will cry for the little child whose mother lacked, uh, who's, uh, lacked a mother's love? And who will cry for a child who cried to the Father above? Who will cry for a child whose smile is hot hid behind pain? And who will cry for the child covered in tears like rain? Who will cry for the child whose world is filled with hate? And who will cry for the little child who has so little faith? Who will cry for the child where love 
may never be seen. Who will cry for the little child who cries inside of me? The answer is that Jesus will. And now that I told you a small portion of my story, I know that many of you have your own stories of, and some of you might even have more things that are more terrifying or even worse. But I want to share something with you. How would you reach someone like me if you were an evangelist? Should you just give up? Now I left a little bit of the details out of this story. But before I go back and fill in the gaps, let me introduce to you the main character of this story. You see, it's actually not me. I'm not the main character. In fact, I'm the least of them all. Let me tell you who the main character is. A little more than 2,000 years ago, a child was born of a virgin woman, sent by God to earth, and when he became a man, he died on a cross to save the world and reestablish our relationship with God the Father. And his name is Jesus. So this sermon is called The Greatest Story Ever Told. His story. Amen? Jesus will save anyone who believes. Ask the blind man who had never seen Jesus after his healing or until his healing. In the book of John, verse 9, chapter 1 through 12, and verse 25, it reads, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming, and I, uh, night is coming, and so when no, one can, when no one can work. And so while I'm in the world, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, and he made some mud of the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes, and he told him to go and wash it in the pool. And so the men went and washed it and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? I am, um, and some said, no, it wasn't. And some said, yes, it is, but it, it looks like him. But he himself said, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus. He made some mud and put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to the pool and wash. And so I went and washed, and I then, and then I could see. And where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. But one thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see. Hallelujah. So I, thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's okay. It's all right. So do me a favor. I want you to just put your hands over your eyes with me. And imagine being permanently in darkness, never being able to see people. Year after year, the people walking in and out of your life, having no commitments, having no stability, being homeless or having nowhere to live, or perhaps no love as people just walk past you and ignore your plea for help, and no hope thinking that the entire, that your entire life will be like this forever. You see, this is how the blind man felt until he met Jesus. Hallelujah. Where is this Jesus, you ask, right? And what can he do for me? Well, in Luke chapter 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, Jesus said, because I am sent, I have, because I have been anointed, I, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news 
to the poor, Jesus said. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover of sight of the blind and so that the oppressed can be free. Is there anyone out here today seeking freedom? Hallelujah. Well, get ready because he will free anyone who believes in him, anyone who has no commitments, anyone who has no stability, anyone who feels that they have no will to live, anyone who feels that you have no hope and no love. And now that I shared that story with you, there's one last thing that I must share. You see, there's a part of my story that I left out, and every story has a beginning and an ending. And yes, my life has been full of trials and tribulations. And many of you have dealt with trials and tribulations. But God, he knew that. He knew that from the beginning. He knew exactly what you were going to go through. He had it already planned, not that he allowed it, not that he caused those things to happen. Holy Spirit, move. But that he allowed you to recover from those things that happened. Amen? So he didn't just do that for me. There's many of you that are here that have the same testimonies. Hallelujah. And so God knew that going into foster care would allow me to apply for a full ride scholarship to the University of Illinois in Champaign through DCFS. And out of hundreds of applications, he knew that I would get the scholarship and become one of the first in my family to go to college. And at the age of 19, God knew that I would look out the window of my 11th floor dorm and that I would cry out to him for help. And that I would feel his heavenly arms wrapped around my lonely body. And I went to church the next Sunday and heard the preacher talk about forgiveness and how we must forgive others before we can be forgiven of our sins. He knew that I would accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and then go on to forgive my mother and my father and all of those that have hurt me. He knew that I would begin to heal in my brokenness and that I would thirst for him and that which the enemy meant for bad, God meant for good. And it was Jesus who gave me a football coach in high school, Coach Spurlock, and he was a positive male figure in my life, and he was like a father figure. And it was God that knew that I would want to go back and to share my story with thousands of youth in foster care and that I would start a nonprofit organization to work with those youth and to become a mentor to those people to help them to overcome the pain and the hurt and the disappointment of being in foster care. God knew that my brother would get shot and killed, and he knew that we would lose a brother, and that my mother would lose a son at the age of 21. But God knew that I could relate to someone who lost a child due to the violence that we have in Chicago. He knew that I would decide to marry a woman, but that we weren't ready, and then it would result in separation and divorce. But while he doesn't condone it, he forgives those who seek forgiveness. And he knew that I would suffer, but that I have grown to understand the importance of marriage and that it's not a game to be played. And we don't talk about divorce up in here, but I'm gonna talk about it today because it can help somebody. Because God still loves me and he loves you too. Jesus knew that his story would draw me closer and closer to him. He knew that I would need a positive spiritual men in my life, and so he put those men in my life. And when I was in Atlanta under Reverend E.D. Hooks, I became a local pastor of Shy Temple CME Church, and I began the journey of living a godly life. And he knew that I would move back to Chicago to join a church where I would be an armor bearer to Apostle Wilkinson, and where he would... Uh, he was a great man of God, and he was a devoted husband and father to his children, giving me an example of what it's like to be a great father to my child. And he blessed me with Mr. Bernie Holland, a man of God who taught me about 
Christ and him crucified. And finally, he knew that I would serve under Pastor Cersei and who encouraged me through the years and who trusts me with the flock to know that I won't scatter you. God knew that my love for my mom would grow as our relationship grew through the years. And he knew that she would desire the freedom and the love that Jesus gave me and that it would attract her, which led her to be saved. And now she's resting in heaven. Hallelujah. You see, the devil also wanted to take my daughter away, but the devil is a liar. God knew that the earthly doctor would say that my daughter wasn't going to live. But because I prayed without ceasing, the Lord spoke in a soft voice like the wind in my ear and said, because of your prayer and your faithfulness, your daughter will live. And against all odds, my daughter miraculously recovered from all of her injuries and is alive and well. And you've seen her dancing in the aisles today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And after four long years of battling with DCFS, I won my case and it proclaimed my innocence. Hallelujah. You see, God knew that this story needed to be told, so he directed me to share it. So no one in here can tell me that God doesn't exist, because I know, and you can't take that away from me. And due to the unfortunate battles, I ended up co-founding a nonprofit organization called Family Justice Resource Center. And we advocate and connect parents who are wrongly accused of abuse. And we offer them free resources to help them with their case. And I am the board treasurer and secretary of that organization. You know that foster care organization that I co-founded years ago that let me go? Eventually in forgiveness, I was able to reconnect with the staff and my former business partners. And also just a few weeks ago, I was the keynote speaker at the DCFS Youth Advisory Board Summit. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Many of those youth that I've worked with years ago, I still coach them today. It never ended regardless of what they said, because the truth shall set you free. I knew that I was innocent, and God knew that I was innocent, and God knows that you're innocent, and even if you're guilty, God will wash away your sins and your pain and your guilt if you trust him and allow him to work for your good and for the glory of him. Hallelujah. You see, I took the skills that I learned from the nonprofit I took the skills that I had learned and I, uh, from the nonprofit, and in June of 2014, I started a consulting company called Lawler Consulting Group, LLC. And I help, serve, I help youth serving organizations save time and money by providing them with grant writing, evaluations, and program development. And I have several clients in the Chicago area. And so God knew that I would overcome the tragedies and turn them into triumphs. So finally, God knew that I, would, I wouldn't give up on the calling. He called me to this ministry of evangelism. He called me to be the storyteller and the recruiter to the cause by sharing the knowledge of the Son of God. And so I will graduate from Wheaton College with my master's in evangelism. And I will become the next generation of evangelists, sharing my story of how Jesus' story have changed my life forever. And one day, they will say, is that Tony? The little child that was lost and broken? Wait, that can't be him. I am the man.
Well, how did you get here? I don't know. I was blind and now I see. But why did you have to suffer? And Jesus would say, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So maybe you are without stability or commitment or hope or love. Maybe you are blinded by this world and the things of it. And maybe you want to see. The doors of, the sal of salvation are open and it's open to all who will believe. And if that is you, I want you to come out from your comfort zone and step into God's zone because he will rewrite all of our wrongs and make them right. And he will set the oppressed free and he will change the ending of the story if you believe. Now I was blind and I was oppressed by the devil and I was believing that I couldn't do what I was called to do. I felt trapped like a prisoner in a cell, though the doors was wide open. I felt that I was unworthy of God to use me with all of my mess and all of my brokenness. I wanted to be free, free to come out of that cage. Is that you? Is that you? Is that you? Is that you? Jesus will wipe away the record of your past, def past defeats, and he will turn them into future victories. He is willing to do it if, you, if only you would let him, like he did for me. So we all have a story to tell. We all have a story of survival, a story of a will to live and a determined to live. But God is able to do anything that we ask according to his will. The great thing about Christ's story is that he makes our entire story relevant. And it is important and, and, and important once he is placed at the center of it. So Jesus is real, everyone. Jesus is real, in case you didn't know it. Jesus is real. I once was lost, but now I see he laid down his life for me, and he will do it the same for you. So will you come today to join me in his grace and be a part of his story? Today is the day, and don't let this day pass. So let Jesus rewrite your ending today. So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, if any of you who are in here today are not saved, that means that you have never confessed Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, but you feel something inside of you pulling closer and closer to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand if there's any one of you, if there's any one of you, I just want you to raise your hand and be acknowledged by him today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, with everyone else, maybe you're already saved, but you have not been sharing Christ and how he has used you. We are all responsible for sharing the gospel. Not just an evangelist, not just the pastor, not just the folks that are in ministry. We are all responsible for sharing. So you all have a purpose and only a set amount of time to accomplish that. So I'm asking, will you walk with me if you have not been sharing your story 
if you have not shared how God has used you, then I'm asking you to walk with me. I'm asking you to repent, meaning that we're going to change the way that we think, that we used to think, that we're not going to be afraid anymore to share this good news, no matter the cost. Now, I've laid everything down here at the altar. I have no shame of what I have done because God has walked, washed away the shame. And yes, no one is perfect. I'm not perfect. No one is perfect but Jesus. And so even as a believer, you still will go through some things. But God can write and rewrite the story so that your ending doesn't have to be your beginning. And Dr. Charles Stanley said it best, don't waste time because life and time is very important. God has given you enough time to do his will, to pray, to seek him, to follow him, and to obey him. And I'm adding to share your story that promotes the gospel, which is the greatest story ever told. So you don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to have a special degree to share your story of how Jesus changed your life. All you have to do is promise to share it today. So if that's you, I'd like you to stand. If you're going to stand and agree with me, stand and agree with me that we're going to share our story more with Christ. If that's you, just stand, stand. If that's you, if you're going to share your story, not be afraid anymore to, to just share your story, to share what God has done for you. It doesn't matter if it's with a neighbor, with a co-worker, but, but if you're standing, that means that you make a promise to God that you won't be ashamed of him, that you won't be afraid to say that Jesus is in your life. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It matters what God thinks. Hallelujah. Let us pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this word, this opportunity. We hope and pray, Lord, that it has touched the heart and the lives of someone in this place. So, Father, we repent of thinking our old way of not sharing the gospel or the good news or our story. And we ask, Lord, that you give us the faith and the strength and the courage to share that word, to share how you have healed us in our broken hearts. Have you saved us? Have you have freed us, Lord God, from oppression and depression? How you have freed us, Lord, from hurt and pain. And we thank you, Lord God, as every heart and mind is focused on you. We give you praise, Lord God. We give you honor, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord. And we pray that this word was, was edifying and for the building up of your church. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. So, so, during the time that I was preaching, we had, uh, we had, some, we had uh, the prophetic, the word being shared. And so she, she's going to turn these around as I was preaching. Here's the, here's the visual. an honor to be here. I'm a prophetic painter, and uh, this is the way I worship God, and it's also my evangelistic tool. Rick and I go out to the highways and the byways, like to um, parks and, and uh, just different events, and we set up and do these paintings of Jesus. 
What's interesting is the first, we painted for the first church. It was all about evangelism. Out of that one came, it, it's, it's parallel with what you were speaking on. And this morning, the spirit of adoption, and it's a little girl who doesn't have, you know, who is in foster care or whatever, and she's cuddling up to a line of Judah. And then through the fire of the Holy Spirit, she rises up out of that and takes a step of faith and plants her seed into people telling them the story of Christ. So that's from this morning. These three paintings are from this morning, parallel with what you're teaching. This, yeah, this one, I, this one was painted at home, but I just went ahead and brought it, and I wasn't going to show it until you said, look, Pastor, The door is open. Now, I, I, did, I didn't speak. This is how God works and how the prophetic works. I painted this at home, not even hearing the sermon. But I saw the person in the cage. And look, there's God's hand. Again, to go with a step of faith. So, her, the door is open. She just needs to come out of the cage. And if you notice, there are not even any bars on this side of the cage. And look at this one, Pastor. So this is what, what Tony did. He stepped up out of the dead, dry bones of his past. Do you see the dead, dry bones? He stepped up out, out of the dead, dry bones of the past to be on point as an evangelist called into ministry. Now, this, he was talking about we are ambassadors in chains, but you know what? That doesn't make us a prisoner. That makes us free. This is the, this represents all of you. We are all supernatural beings for God, super wonder women, super men. We can break the chains in others' lives and fly and see the boss is coming off of her out of the supernatural that God empowers us with. So this represents this body, how free we are, even because of the trials that we've been through. Now we are set free to set others free. And finally, finally, this is it. It's all because of Jesus. This is the greatest story of all. These pieces that make up the face of Jesus are all pieces of our past and our brokenness all coming together. To, see, it's like a shattered stained glass window, but they're all coming together to make the beautiful face of Jesus, the great creator, and you are his beautiful masterpiece. And this is the greatest story ever told, so go out and tell it in Jesus' name.